thank you so so much for joining joining us um today um it's today actually yes um i'm really excited to actually see all of you back and um i know um hakan hetol um from previous sort of conversations and anna what a pleasure to meet you um and just for our audience i would like to ask all of you to introduce yourselves um to share a little bit about what you do um in your companies and in open banking in particular and i'll start with anna if you don't mind um and we'll go sure Thank you so much, Anna. You're welcome. So it's very nice to meet you again as well. And thank you for the invitation uh, for talking today to you. Um, I am head of Open Banking at BBA Spain. And uh, before, uh, I was leading digital transformation for enterprise clients at BBA Spain, uh, leading the creation of solutions leverage on data for enterprise clients to help them um, make better financial decisions. So I've been quite uh, quite close to PSC2 in in from many perspectives. Previously, I was a vice president in payments and collections in the transition to SEPA. So I'm very close also to European regulations in their deployment. And previously, I worked at, at Accenture as a uh, sorry as a strategy consultant. But specialize in B2B solutions and also in a, in a Spanish startup. So I, I've been always quite connected to the digital environment, although my is more more from business from for my studies. And I, mm -hmm. I think uh, thank you, Anna. A quick bio of myself. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, now I, I'd like to move on to Hetal. Um, Please introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit more what you do with Open Banking. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I joined HSBC four years ago to lead the Open Banking work. Initially, the UK Competition Markets Authority CMA implementation, which is a, effectively a prototype and a, in some ways an extension or a tightening of PSD2 requirements for the large banks in the UK, um, and then led the work for PSD2 compliance uh, across our 30 markets in Europe. Um, as we've come out of PSD2, I'm now the global product lead for open banking as we move into new markets. <clears throat> uh, we're now live in 19 markets with open banking services of various types. Um, and, and that's going to grow steadily through 2021 as well as particularly in ASP and the Americas, we're seeing markets follow um, the trajectory set by Europe. Prior to open banking and digital thing that I spent most of my career in front office um, commercial banking coverage. So I'm, I'm a lender by background. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, and now, the last but not least, um, Hakan, would you be able to introduce yourself for the audience? Thank you so much. Uh, and and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, Hakan Eroglu, uh, my name. I'm uh, the Open Banking Lead in MasterCard Data and Services, uh, looking after our overall um, advisory, but also validated services in open banking. So everything that sits on top of open banking infrastructure, um, helping issuer banks, um, merchants, all, all of these um, stakeholders in the ecosystem to help to tackle open banking from a strategic point of view, but also from uh, application point of view. So what can I build as a bank or what can I build as a merchant to make the most out of open banking? Yeah, open banking applications such as recommendation engines, um, personal finance managers, credit decisioning, so all of these valued services. And also more into the area of data insights as well. So what do you do with the data on top of the application? Um, as I said, credit scoring, um, um, you know, seller certificate. So it's all of these kind of um, micro use cases that you can build on top of data. Um, before MasterCard, I was um, the open banking expert uh, globally in Accenture for a while. Um, and before that, I was working as a payment architect. So I'm, I'm coming from the payment space, uh, jumped into the open banking topic through PSD2, as most of, of, of us uh, looking into open banking. Um, and I'm, because uh, it was mentioned what, what you have studied, I'm a computer scientist, so I'm more like a coming from a technical space, but uh, tap into strategy and uh, business consulting. Now with MasterCard, I'm happy to lead that space, MasterCard, and happy to be here today. 
Thank you very much. Well, um, I'm definitely in the in the wonderful company. Thank you so much. And just looking at the theme for today's conversation, um, sounds a little bit sort of um, serious. And we're talking about the challenges of implementation of PSD2 and how can you kind of, it's a nice launch pad, you know, you, the architect, um, and everyone else would uh, be able to shed some light on some challenges. And one of the uh, main um, issues, I think, um, that's where we would start is the implementation of the strong customer authentication. That um, We're talking about a deadline that was set um, and uh, um, some of the companies, some of the banks and um, firms missed the deadline. So um, why, why did that happen? Um, um, Anna, would you be able to share some shed some light on that? On do you mean on strong customer authentication and their strong implementation? Authentication. Oh, okay. Um, I think uh, strong customer authentication has had a great impact uh, to banks, consumers, merchants and both on e-commerce, but also on physical commerce. And for all players, it has meant a great effort in, in adapting. Every country did it quite differently. And there is not only the impact in investments in our own channels for banks and building APIs, but it has, it has been a huge impact in, in user experience. So in, in our case, at VVA, we, we were moving to, to security measures uh, towards eliminating, S, before PSD2, eliminating SCA for the benefit of the user experience and um, replacing it with monitoring transactions, behavioral analysis, and so on and so on for, the, uh, for, for convenience for the user. And for us, PSC2 has set uh, another security standard that we, we had to to comply with. And it has had a, an impact on what I said in investments uh, for for deploying it, but also in the user experience that we offer in our own channels. And, and also we have, we have also some, there, there were uncertainty in, cer in certain aspects, like for example, in direct channels that business client use. And so we had to, to talk with, uh, with our national competent authority to get the exemption of SCA of these channels with our direct channels that our clients use for uh, making payments or getting uh, account statements. And there are some some issues we are working still on, like whitelisting and exemptions. I think it's, it's a topic that is not ended. Thank you, Anna. Um, well, how can same question to you? So, what do the new rules um, implemented for strong customer authentication mean for firms, and why there were, what, yeah. why there's been a problem with implementing it in time? <clears throat> um. I think uh, for payments, as I think Anna has mentioned that, right? It has an impact, the SAS impact on uh, the uh, um, you know, point of sale transactions when it comes to card transactions, for example, or contactless, uh, and then on e commerce as well, right? Um, on top of the SCA that you need for, uh, for open banking, right? The APIs that you need SCA. Um, but when it comes to payments, I think payments is uh, very one of the key areas you need to look at in payments is um, kind of a frictionless customer experience it needs to be easy to use for the customers um, and also to reduce the decline uh, declined uh, transactions as well right um, you need to balance between security but also convenience for the customer um, and since you know um, payments card payments or e-commerce payments are established already and you know, um, PSPs, acquirers, banks were concerned about um, that if it's not implemented properly and also not communicated properly, and this is also an area we need to look at, is the communication mm. to the end consumers. Because if they don't understand what's happening right now after the 14th of September and they make a payment and it's being declined, or they're asking for a second factor for a PIN or whatever. Um, I think that's an area that the industry was super concerned. Um, and that's why it look, took a bit longer to just to be sure about, is it properly implemented? Is, you know, technically, is it also communicated to the end consumers that they don't, uh, they are not upset about using this payment method. 
and it has impact to the revenues of the merchant as well because if cards or other type of payments are um, declined and consumers are frustrated it has an impact on the conversion rate in the in the basket when it comes to the checkout process um i think that that was the other part i think um there were some you know um solutions around that like 3ds um 2.2 2, 2, for example where you can apply certain type of exemptions uh, from PSD2, like whitelisting and, and others, to make sure that you have a cust uh, frictionless customer experience. On the other hand, you have the level of security that's required. And this implementation took a while, took a bit longer than expected. Mm. Thank you, Hakan. Hecho, um, from your experience, um, what do you think there have been challenges? Why have there been challenges to implementing uh, the new rules for strong customer authentication? I, mean, I think at the outset, we, I know my co panelists would agree that everyone agrees that the new rules are progressive and helpful for consumers. They increase the quality of security that consumers across Europe and, and the UK can expect from their, their financial service providers. And that's a really good thing. But they're also extremely specific, and I'm sure uh, Anna and, and SMEs in, in all the other major firms would, would agree that each firm will have found 90% of the rules are very, very sensible, and in many cases we were already meeting them. But for each firm, there would have been 5 or 10% of the rules, which were, for you know, legacy reasons, quite challenging to meet. And that might be just because of design issues that were hard-baked into our systems, which were then very difficult to adapt. Or potentially we would have had a small brand or a runoff portfolio you know, there's lots of examples where in complicated financial institutions um, exact adherence to quite specific rules can be quite challenging and i think that was that's certainly something that, that we've seen and i know many other institutions have seen i think an additional thing that made it really difficult was um the, the initial legislation um left room for interpretation as is often the case with any legislation and regulatory guidance, mainly via the EBA's Q&A tool, and often, in a number of cases, came through relatively late in the process. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you may remember in June last year, I think it was, there was a, an EBA opinion published, um, which had material impact on cards and card pay payment authentication. It had material impact on a number of other parts of PSC2 as well. Um, uh, and I wouldn't find fault with any of the points they've raised and any of the recommendations. I think they are the right place to end up. But recommendations that come through four months before a deadline to implement are, are, are potentially going to be a challenge if you weren't expecting that particular recommendation. And there are a number of those which wrong-footed firms and wrong-footed entire um, NCAs and market ecosystems. So I think that's just one of the perennial problems you have with a um, with European legislation, each market has a different starting point. Mm. European legislation does force harmonisation, which is a good thing, it simplifies things for consumers, but in some cases, that then does create more challenges than in others. So you just have to work through that. Um, thank you. Um, since the subject, as I said, it's, it's not a light one. We're talking about challenges and uh, there have been some more challenges like uh, lack of standard for APIs and uh, the deadline for um, open banking implementation, the S September uh, 2019 deadline. So another deadline um, again got pushed. Um, so why, 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 was, why, why was it the case again? You know, why did that happen head hole? I think with hindsight, we now know that 18 months from ratification of the RTS to having a full live ecosystem in any market, even just amongst the major institutions in that market um, and the major TPPs, was not enough time. I think at the time the legislators and drafters of PSD wrote that, they couldn't have known that because no other um, jurisdiction had ever tried to do something this ambitious. And so what they thought was a reasonable timeline, I'm sure based on lots of market feedback as well, has turned out to be quite challenging. And that's okay, you know. If you, I think if you set out to do something really hard and then you find it's gonna take a bit longer than you expected, 
as long as you get to that right end state, which is what we want for our consumers, then I mm. think that's fine. I think we shouldn't be too too quick to judge um, on this one. Europe has set out to do something, as it is with GDPR, which is you know, truly radical, and, and that should be celebrated. And if it's proving a bit, a bit challenging, that's okay, we'll get through that. I think specifically why it's challenging is when you're trying to define from scratch uh, an entire rule book for how an ecosystem is going to function, an entire data standard, a security profile to go with that, have large numbers of participants all then adopt that same thing, and then in in live production go through an inevitable round of software debugging and fixing, that takes time. And, and the original kind of 12-month build plus six-month proving process and wide usage probably turns out to be half of what's needed. It's probably more like a 24 month build and a full year of um, making those groups run really smoothly. And having lived through the UK experience, where we started a bit earlier with a smaller perimeter, that's pretty much what we learned. So the build process has been elongated with more and more functional richness being added. And it, it did take nearly 12 months to really get the ecosystem working, but it is working. And the other major European markets are not far behind UK, despite it having more than a year's head start. So, I think we should. Be, I think we should now say we've learned something about how hard this is to do, but we should be celebrating that it's increasingly getting embedded in all the key markets in across Europe, and that and those that will steadily progress. Mm, thank you, Hadjol. Anna, well, you mentioned in our conversation previously that you know it's new for all players, so. Yeah, what are your thoughts um, about another missed deadline, you know, API standards and, you know, this wonderful challenge? I agree with, with Hatel. I think is a, it was very tight deadlines and it was everything quite immature. It was in for all players. They, they hadn't been in an open banking regulation before PSC2. So it was, a, there were some things that were unclear, for example, how to connect to each bank. Um, the, the specifications for, for many connections were just published in, in the last minute. So it was quite difficult to, to connect. Um, but there were also other issues uh, that maybe could have been solved before, like uh, there, had, there had been different interpretations of what was within the scope of PSE2, what you mentioned before, the, the lack of standards. Although I think here uh, the collaboration between banks and TPPs has been quite fundamental uh, through the Berlin Group. Um, there was some uncertainty in how to solve disputes in this new environment. And, and I think that there has been also um, no incentives to abandon the current solution based on web scraping, since web scraping is not is not prohibited. So there's there's not pressure no pressure to to use APIs instead of, of these other uh, solutions. And moreover, there are also technical issues that that need to be more mature or more or more specified. Like for example. The expiring of tokens has been, in our experience, quite an issue. The authentication of users. Um, and there are many things that we are still making definitions of the regulators are still uh, defining, like, for example, the decoupled biometric authentication. So from September on, we're uh, still making improvements on what we had on the market in, in September 2019. And so I think the implementation of PSD2 is not finished. It is still evolving. And we're, this is, um, we talked before in, in our session before, this is like an evolution of learning for, for all players. But I, I agree also with Hatel that all in all, the progress that uh, has been made is much more positive. So PSD2 is having a, a positive impact in innovation in, in the financial sector in, in Europe. And as an indicator of this, uh, we can see the, the rise no, in, in TPP's register and license at the ABA payment institution register with it, it is increasing, it has increased in 66% year, year one year. So, um, and not only this, there are more, there are more players, but there are also very interesting use cases 
that are coming to market from new payers, but also from from traditional banks. And all this is on the benefit of, of clients. So I think we we have also to to think that it's it has been positive. Mm. Thank you, Anna. Hakan, um, what, what, will you be able to share your thoughts? Um, another deadline missed. So what? Another challenge. Why do you think that was the case? I think uh, Anna and Katal have, have talked about it, uh, these points. I think I can uh, disagree. I think one of the areas that uh, that I've experienced when working uh, for for banks on open on PSD two implementation was like um, every few weeks when there was an EBA opinion paper or um, in the Q and A Q and A tool um, a certain type kind of uncertainty on interpretations. Um, you need to have a spanner network between banks to ask others what they have done, uh, how did they implement, how did they interpret these different exemptions or scope of products. It consumed a lot of time um, to um, to really come to a conclusion. Um, you know what functionalities are in place. How should it work? How is the customer flow? Um, what does obstacle really mean when it comes to uh, customer experience? So a, a list of issues, right, that need to be clarified. Um, and plus the fragmentation, right, of the legislation, which is a directive, and you have um, 27 and UK um, countries um, looking into it, and every NCA has a slightly different interpretation. And we know all about that. It's a, it's a challenge in Europe anyways. Um, and now, regulation, uh, regulating technology or a certain type of business models across the whole continent is challenging. Um, that's why, you know, the the 18 months uh, it was uh, very tough, um, would have been probably more appropriate to have a phased approach with, you know, a um, few steps or few phases to make sure that everyone uh, is can keep pace with the development. Um, and then, of course, uh, openness is, is um, is not is quite new to a few banks uh, you know having api layers building the technology connecting to the to the security systems uh, exposing sca um you know that you know that created a whole industry right um of technology providers to help to close all the gaps in the ecosystem to make it work uh, which is also a good thing because it creates creativity and to solve the problems um, another area that I would see is, I mean, we talked about standards, API standards. We have, you know, Berlin Group, STAT, I don't know, the national API flavors as well, um, which is a good development because there was nothing before that. And we have, you know, the market has worked quite closely together to come up with this kind of a de facto standard. I'm living in Switzerland, so even the Swiss market has adopted Berlin Group uh, and added a fl Swiss uh, flavor on top of it to make it Swiss. So um, I think uh, that was um, also a very good development. And um, yeah, I think um, overall, I think that's um, it's a good progress, but there's still a way to go. Um, and uh, PSC2 is just the first step of a, of a whole journey into you know open finance you know the uk is currently running a consultation on open finance to see how how can that be uh, evolved into an overall open finance or let's say end-to-end uh, -end finance ecosystem for consumers and businesses um i think that will be the same with psc2 we just you know was um uh um, talked about in the media that the commission eu commission is thinking about you know the open finance um, an open finance legislation by next week, next year, uh, until 2022, uh, to think about how PSD2 can be, um, you know, extended into other areas as well with a broader product scope than just payments and uh, current accounts. So there's much more to come, but I think um, there's less. There are lots of lessons learned. Many jurisdictions from outside Europe are looking into Europe just to learn from these, you know, um, gaps or mistakes that have been done uh, to make it better work in other jurisdictions. Thank you, Hakan. It's really interesting you're talking about sort of the expanding breadth of um, sort of um, use for open banking. You're talking about open finance and that the regulators are now looking how to expand that kind of vision. 
Um, it kind of, but if we just bring it back to open banking, do you think actually open banking is taking off, or do you think actually consumers today are still holding back on adopting and using the new products that are being made available? Um, um, Hatol, I'll start with you if that's okay. Yeah. Um... I would say yes, it has taken off. So if I look across HSBC's 13 countries now in, in Europe, all with various types of open bank implementation, uh, we're seeing more than 2 million calls per day being handled by our, by our platforms. Um, we are on a, certainly by end of year, we will have a run rate of more than half a billion euros a day of, uh, sorry, euros a, a year of pay, payments. That's a year, not per day. Um, uh, we're, we're trending. Uh, we're up. We're up above three hundred thousand customers using open banking that we can track as unique customers, uh, growing roughly fifteen to twenty percent month for month. Mm. So, you know, those are all non-trivial numbers. Uh, that it, it's hard to look at those numbers and say this is this has failed in some sense because you know we've made a system available, but there are customers working through TPPs, connecting to us to make that happen. And these are real payments, real API calls and, and uh, MCI access requests. So, so that's working. Is it growing as fast as some would have hoped? Would they like to see, see more innovation and uh, more more push through this? I'm sure there are some who'd like to see more. I'm sure there are some who have more conservative forecasts. I think we're based, based on what we, we learned from the UK's initial adoption, this feels about right. There is a period of stabilization, TPPs betting in and um, proving propositions to themselves and to customers can work end to end before we start to drive mass adoption. Um, we know that um, in mature markets, like all European markets, adoption of new financial innovation tends to be relatively measured, even contactless, which is quite a slow adoption curve. And when you think the difference between chip and pin and contactless is, is tiny, it's a bit muscle memory. Yet adoption is quite slow. Interesting, it spiked up this year thanks to COVID. So sometimes you need a push. So I think I think we're actually where, where we would expect to be. Um, we're seeing more and more TPPs come to us with requests for can they access additional types of data or the variants of the service moving beyond pure reg. So so we are seeing that um, wave of innovation and and entrepreneurship that we would all have hoped comes out of this. And I think some of those um, use cases are going to be coming to market relatively quickly. And they vary by market, of course. Market context in each market is different in Europe. Um, but, but I'd say that no, we're actually in a pretty good place and we're starting to see that really grow. I think if you looked at this in January, you might have said, well, we're still in that kind of technical proving phase. But, but we're seeing that, we're seeing ourselves come out of that quite nicely. Mm. Well, um, thank you, Hatchel. I, I take it as a permission to kind of just change the mood of the question. So rather than asking whether open bank banking actually t took off or not, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, what are the examples of actually showing that open banking is um, on an upward sort of trajectory, as it were? Yeah, I think, as you say, think open banking uh, has taken off worldwide. But I also think that open banking took place uh, and took off before P PSE2. But it's true that PSE2 regulating like, yeah, just through services has also boosted the, the use of APIs and the openness of financial institutions. And, and now you, when you see a, APIs exposed or services exposed to third parties by financial institution, it's just more, more than triple so in, in Europe. So it's, I think, it has for sure uh, taken off. And, and yes, we see like a quite interesting partnerships in, in the market where financial services are integrated in the flow of, of, of a merchant or of a partner. For example, when we in BBA, we partnered with Uber in, in Mexico to open accounts directly from the Uber platform for, for Uber drivers. And what was uh, quite convenient for them because it's the country where 
uh, were clients or were persons at not ma not that much uh, bankerized, so they don't have bank accounts. So it's, it was a use case quite quite interesting for, for them. But there are quite other use cases, like for example, quantum partnering with with Holdet, uh, offering services for for SMEs, and so on and so on. I think. Um, Open banking and also the need of real time is boosting the use of APIs. And in my opinion, the main pillars for for customers uh, using open banking solutions is uh, that they are built for their convenience. They are they have uh, quite focus in user experience, and they are trustful. And so it's not uh, that much about um, what open banking services you offer to the client or which uh, not, not, not much focus on, on open banking, but um, on how the user uh, sees that uh, financial services are integrated there where they have the necessity of, of that financial service. So um, it's for the for the benefit benefit of the user, who is um, the owner of his data and who decides with whom to share it uh, for his benefit, and also in making transactions quite real time, smoothly, quite seamlessly, with uh, in a unique experience end to end. Mm, thank you, Anna. Hakan, what do you think regulators should be doing to help? Um, making um help make open banking this year work more effectively so i'm just kind of moving on and mm -hmm. since you said like you know the, you've got yeah. a bigger picture of the eu states implementation standards so what regulators could do to help you know drive the initiative forward yeah so i think um from that what we have seen so far right with psc2 um with other regulations where we have seen how it how they are doing it and um, of regulators asking for advice from the market, um, what's the right approach in tackling open banking. Um, and this is just the open banking in the in the from the perspective of the regulator, right? Because when we debate about what is open banking, there are different variances of what open banking could mean. But when it comes to the regulation, I think um, that what we have seen so far in the market is, and we talked about PSD2 and the hurdles, um, the pitfalls, um, you know, things take, take longer than expected, right? Um, the implementation of APIs, of infrastructure, it takes time. It's, it, it was underestimated, the complexity of so many participants in the market with different interests ongoing influence by different groups to the regulator to think, think uh, change things into their favor. I think that helped us to, you know, think about, you know, um, probably why not directly being transparent at the beginning and think about how can we do that in a more approach, like a phased approach um, to have like, you know, APIs or certain type of use cases more in a phased approach to say, you know, the first phase could be to get the banks to engage with open banking, with um, building first use cases that are easy to implement um, and that are not really harming or attacking, cannibalizing their business at the beginning. Because we have seen that in PSC2, that banks were concerned about, you know, what that, what that, what what happens to our business? Um, how can we protect? How can we build our own strategy around it? But I think to have a very smooth entrance into open banking would be beneficiary um, the other one is um, as well to think about whether it should be prescriptive or more a collaborative approach uh, we have seen the uk is a highly prescriptive regulation with providing clear guidelines on um, you know protocols technology standards field down to the data field level um, that we haven't had that in PSD2. We, it was open to the market to come up with standards. Um, so that's something that might, you know, the truth is somewhere in the middle to think about the, the regulators are providing kind of the frame, the guideline, um, the scope, and probably the deadlines in a phased approach. And the industry can come up with certain type of standards and solutions because they know the best how to do it. 
prescriptive regulations are difficult because uh, when technology is evolving, when use cases are evolving, mm -hmm. you need to you know change a lot again uh, across across the board. Um, the last point I wanted to mention, and our, the list is long, but um, is custom experience. Everyone is saying that, but um, uh, open banking is not a self-purpose, right? We are not doing that just because we have this topic and we are all experts and talk about open banking. Um, that also answers the question before, right? That consumers did it take up, right? The open banking. Consumers are not interested in open banking. It's a, something that we are talking about to enable mm -hmm. use cases that are, you know, benefit, uh, serving them. So think about custom experience. Think about what um, what is missing in the ecosystem. How can that solve with APIs? And open banking is just a vehicle to get there. And the very last point is don't stop with open banking as the definition that we know that was coined by Europe with um, payment initiation, current account information, just go broader, like with open finance, that what the UK is currently doing. Um, when you start regulating, when you think about the regulation in your country, think about um, what has been discussed before, what the, where do we stand now, and what, where do you, what do you want to be known for as an economy to go the next step in, in open banking, which is open finance or open X, um, probably just to start first use cases with other industries, with mobility, um, combining it with 5G, for example, you know, billions and trillions of data sets are being created in the future. How can banks play a role here? And I think regulators can play, you know, the, the driver here in this, this development. Mm. Brilliant, Hakan. Thank you. Just Anna, I'm going to bring you in very briefly here. And um, just the point that you made in our conversation in terms of regulators should think globally. Can you just elaborate on this point, you know, just to help um, make open banking and SCM work more effectively? So why would they need to think globally? Thank you. Yes, I think um, PSD2 is, is just a beginning, the, but it's only regulating banking data and what defines a person and how it behaves and what uh, he does and, and, and everything to offer him personalized services is not only transactional data, this is, this is only one part, but it was what we have with PSD2. So there's a need of a holistic approach to uh, the data. And we talked before in our conversation that GDPR uh, is beginning to TED, but GDPR is quite different because it misses transmitting the data in an electronic way, the structure, and also in real time, which is quite a benefit, I think, of, of PSE2. So um, the frame is set, but there is the need, I think, of an, an open data regulation that um, affects all the sectors, like energy consumption, uh, uh, geolocalization, and so to know what you what you consume, what where you move, uh, where you are, what you buy, and so that affects all the sectors to to truly build uh, a level playing field, and so that the consumer, the user, can really use his data on his own benefit. And I think also that um, the PSC two approach uh, is quite uh, quite promising, but it's only within Europe. And this world is digital, and digital means global. So we need global regulations uh, that apply to all geographies, not only uh, limited geographies like right now. At all. Um, how are red tech solutions sort of how are they helping financial institutions like HSBC comply with PSDT? So I think there's a number of things we've um, almost bought off the shelf. So some, and, and these are good examples of how these are standard problems, not just to financial services, but to to, to many service providers. And RegTech can can support all of our industries. For example, um, SIM swap is a key control to stop customers' phones, which have been stolen or lost, from being used to access bank accounts without their um, their permission. Um, and there's a range of swim top technologies that, that you can procure directly from and, and rather than try to build something ourselves, we've absolutely just gone and bought that from market. Uh, similarly, malware protection in multiple channels is a, is a provision within PSD2 and it's a, it's a 
malware is a problem that it impacts many industries. Again, if there are components and solutions out there that and then we, we went through a procurement process and chose chose a vendor and, and moved forward on that basis. Um, within the cards ecosystem, uh, there's a number of control points needed to implement SCA. And for each of those, we've we've selected specific vendors. But we're at the moment choosing who to use for behavioral biometrics, which is one of the kind of more exciting headline um, pieces that we need for um, cards SCA, which is you know is slightly deferred. So I think RegTech has been absolutely critical. And, what, and the, key, the key theme here is these are all components and capabilities that are not specifically needed by financial services and banks. They're needed by many, many industries who are providing digital services to customers in a secure way. And we're just one of the latest consumers to wake up to that and say, yeah, that's, that's what we need as well. And I think that's where RegTech really brings benefit because it, it starts to bring some of these real sources of protection and transparency to each of our digital ecosystems that we participate in. Brilliant, thank you. Well, I think it's all we have um, time for. Um, thank you very much to all the panelists for joining us today. And I th thank our audience who listened in. I really hope that you really enjoyed this um, session as much as I did. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you as well. <laughs>